Uh, how does anesthesia actually work? Like, what is the mechanism there? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, nobody knows for sure. We know that in the uh, uh, 1800s, uh, a group of gases were discovered, which when inhaled at low concentrations called euphor caused euphoria, giddiness. And uh, this was like e diethyl ether. So they had parties called ether frolics where everybody sniffed a little bit of ether, <laughs> danced around, acted stupid and fell over. And, or nitrous oxide laughing gas, the same mm, thing. Yeah. And they realized that if they, if they gave more than they did fall over and become unconscious, and as long as uh, the, you didn't give too much, and as long as they didn't vomit and aspirate and a few other things, they woke up perfectly fine. And so it began to be used for surgery. They gave enough anesthesia to put the guy to sleep. They would take out a tumor. The first one was done on a, a big neck mass at Mass General in 1846. And it started to be used for anesthesia for surgical procedures. That was the first time it was used, 1846. Right. Wow. And I'm sure it took a while before we actually got it right. Because <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a scary thing, anesthesia. That's why the anesthesiologists get the paid the most, right? We deserve it. Thank you. I was an anesthesiologist for 49 years. I retired about two years ago. But yeah, it's, wow. a, it's a great field, uh, and it is. It's, it, you have to be very, very careful. A lot of things go on, go wrong, could go wrong, and uh, especially as we do sicker and sicker patients with older, you know, like even in my career, we, we did more and more elderly, sicker patients with complex disease. And, you know, and the interplay between the heart and the lungs and the kidney and the liver and everything else comes into play. But basically, you got to, like, not give too much and maintain the airway and make sure they're hydrated and et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, it is a very demanding, uh, rigorous field. Uh, as far as how anesthesia works, um, that's a good question. And uh, the interesting thing is that the anesthetic, anesthetic molecules are all different, but they do exactly the same thing. They affect consciousness and very little else in the brain. So, for example, if you put someone to sleep, they're unconscious, but their brain is still active. Their brain is still working. So, for example, if we're doing surgery... Working as if they're conscious? No. They're okay. not conscious. But for example, let's say we're doing a spinal surgery. So the surgeon's operating on the spinal cord in the neck. And we want to make sure he doesn't do something to the spinal cord because then the patient will be paralyzed, wake up paralyzed. Like put a screw through the bone too far or this or that. So we monitor or we have people come in who monitor the physiological uh, effects. For, so they put electrodes on the, on the feet or the hands, stimulate and record from the brain. So the signal has to go through the spinal cord. And we do that, uh, and, and we can do the anesthetic such that they're unconscious, but these sensory evoked potentials, they're called, are still going on. So the brain is processing these signals. The spinal cord is intact, so that's good. As long as that happens, the surgeon keeps going. And if he gets too close or, or, or squeezes the cord or cuts off the blood supply, the guys say, hey, that we just lost the sensory evoked potential, pull back or do something, mm. and he fixes it. So... Uh, it's, it's a very very effective and useful, and it shows that the brain is, uh, the patients are unconscious, but their brains are still active. And we know that from other reasons. The EEG is still there, just slow. And all this that continues is that the, it's happening at the, the membrane surface of the neurons. So neurons are usually considered to uh, be integrate and fire. So they receive inputs, integrate to a threshold, and then fire an output. So very much like a, a computer chip or a transistor with an input-output mechanism, only at the membrane. And, uh, and that's how, how most people think. And the membrane effects are mediated by receptors and ion channels. And so everybody assumed anesthesia must work on the membranes and membrane receptors and ion channels. But that turned out not to be the case because, as I just told you, the membrane receptors and ion channels continue to work, but the patient can be unconscious. So what's happening? Well, uh, if, you, uh, if you look inside, there are these structures called microtubules that I had become interested in, and that's where they act, as it turns out. So what is, this, is there a fundamental difference between the state of the, the brain when they are under anesthesia, when a human is under anesthesia, versus when they're sleeping? Oh, yeah, it's quite different. When you go to sleep, uh, if somebody uh, pokes you or takes a knife to you, God forbid, uh, you'd wake up and uh, you'd feel it. And uh, anesthetized patients don't respond and don't feel it if they're adequately anesthetized. And uh, w sleep is not well understood either, but it's it's yeah. more of a, a probably a membrane effect or uh, some some hormonal effect, something uh, just uh, chilling out the neuron and making it inactive. But it's arousable if you stimulate it; right. they respond. 
Right. Yeah. A weird thing about anesthesia is I've experienced it a few times is that it's like, it's like an instant from the moment you fall asleep. You, it's like you wake up at one second <laughs> later. Correct. Time does not pass under anesthesia, which is a very interesting thing because the whole nature of time is another mystery. We don't know, or at least the flow of time, you know, how we have an arrow of time while well, we only go forwards in time instead of backwards. And uh, it, it, when you go to sleep at night and you wake up in the morning, you can kind of guess oh, I was asleep a few hours or asleep, you know, a long time. But when you wake up from anesthesia, you have no clue. It could be uh, uh, 30 seconds or, or three hours. Yeah. You, you don't have a, a sense of time. time. Time stops flowing under anesthesia. Yeah, I heard of, um, I've heard a funny description of anesthesia. Well, like I've heard many funny theories about anesthesia. One of them being like, what if, what if uh, anesthesia wasn't really putting you unconscious? What if it was just wiping your memory? <laughs> like, what if when you wake up, you were awake during all that shit? Yeah. They just re erased your memory and you have no memory of it. Because that's well, what it feels like. Well, since uh, we can't directly measure consciousness, I can't mm. say for sure you're conscious. I'm pretty sure you are, but I can't prove it. I might be an NPC. You could be uh, what's called a zombie, a philosophical, philosophical zombie, mm -hmm. someone who acts like us, but doesn't have internal consciousness. And there was this, and there is also this uh, horrible situation of uh, awareness under anesthesia that's usually a mistake. Like you quite literally run out of gas or the, you're not paying attention enough and surgeon gets near something more painful and, and, and uh, the patient uh, responds or feels it. And occasionally the patients who can be paralyzed with muscle relaxants, and we do that so that, uh, to get through muscles for various types of surgery. Uh, and uh, patients have woken up or, or come back and said, I was awake the whole time. What? And there are very rare uh, occasional, uh, you know, they're basically pilot error. You know, usually somebody screws up. Um, but then again, there's also a lot of cases where uh, we do, uh, they're not intended to go to sleep. Let's say you're going to have a, a lump or a bump taken off and the surgeon yeah. will, will numb that up. And then we give you propofol to have you go to sleep, but it's a very light propofol. So yeah. you'll keep breathing. We don't have to worry about that. And that's not designed to have you completely asleep. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, I heard them talking. I was awake the whole time or they go in and out. And that's okay because they're not, they don't need to be asleep because they're not going to feel it because uh, wherever the lump or bump is, is already numb. Mm -hmm. um, or like epidurals, things like epidurals, that. Epidurals, yeah. Spinal taps. Exactly. Spinal uh, anesthesia, uh, epidural, local nerve blocks of various kinds, the arm, the leg, you can do all kinds of things now, field blocks. And, uh, you know, you don't feel anything. And then we put you to sleep because you don't want to lay there bored and anxious for an hour or two or three or right. so then we just give you purple fall sedation and you know some and it's actually good if you wake up a little bit move around and and so forth um and you don't really need to be asleep because you're not going to feel it anyway so a lot of people said yeah i remember i was i was awake the whole time so that uh, that is sometimes taken as uh you know failed anesthetic but it's not however as i said there are occasional horrible situations where a patient is awake due to pilot error. And Have you ever had that happen? It, it's never happened to me. Okay. Uh, personally, in my in my practice, I always erred on the side of uh, uh, a little extra because, you know, it's like a, a bell-shaped curve. So if you're at right at the dose, uh, one standard uh, error of, of patients are going to be, standard deviation are going to be uh, inadequately necessary. So you want to err on the side of and fortunately, it's a good... You'd rather uh, overdose them than underdose them. As long as you don't go too far. So that's right. the art. That's where it comes in. You want to make sure they're, they're asleep, but not too asleep. Mm -hmm. Whenever I've woken up from anesthesia, I felt like I got hit by a truck. I, I It takes me, I feel like, twice as long as normal people. I'm nauseous afterwards, want to mm. throw up. Like, I probably got overdosed. Well... It uh, nausea, you can usually, prov it depends on what the procedure is and also the patient, but, uh, yeah. you know, we can give other drugs that prevent nausea specifically and propofol, which has become the go-to drug for induction for going to sleep, which got a very bad rap because of Michael Jackson, but is actually a fantastic drug. Uh, and, and, and most people wake up feeling good with very little, if any pain, a no nausea and a little, little euphoria and occasionally even, um, erotic dreams when they wake up. Erotic dreams from propofol. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a trade secret, but it does happen. Interesting. Steve, put that on the uh, grocery <laughs> list. <laughs> um, so how long were you doing this for? How long How long have you practiced anesthesiology? 49 years. I 49 years. Yeah. I was going to go for 50, but I figured I'm not going to press my luck. That would be just for show. Was and there any specific type of surgery you would be involved in or was it all types? 
During the course of my career, I did all, all types, and okay. including when I was younger, cardiac, pediatrics, a lot of neurosurgery, uh, oh, wow. some OB. Uh, and uh, after a while, the uh, cardiac, the, the, the heart uh, anesthesia, uh, became specialized, and we had people who just did nothing from but that. Same thing with peds. So over the course of my career, I became more of a generalist, which was fine by me. Mm -hmm. And uh, But uh, over the course of my career, I did pretty much everything, including newborns, the, the scariest, because oh uh, you have very little margin for error. So now we have people who do nothing but very, very tiny babies. Oh my God, I can't imagine. And pediatric hearts are probably the toughest. Pediatric hearts. Yeah, because you got to go on bypass and you got to do this and that. So it's very technical and very, very precise. And you have uh, much less margin for error the s smaller the patient. How crazy was the training? Like, I, I imagine, I've heard stories of neurosurgeons talking about their, uh, like, doing their residency and practicing in hospitals doing brain surgery with no power. Like, you have to imagine the whole building loses power. We still have to freaking cut this guy's head open and do a craniotomy <laughs> on him. Well, there uh, every OR I've been is uh, I've ever been in has a backup power system, and okay. occasionally we've had a power system. You know, the lights go out, but usually within about three or three to five seconds they come back on. Mm -hmm. So I've never been in a situation that I can remember where they were off for a long enough, a very long period. Mm. Yeah, we had uh, this guy Jack Cruz in here. He's a former brain surgeon, and he said that uh, if the building he, he was sitting in the room with me, and we had like a a bag of power tools in the corner. And he's like, if we lost power right now and I had to do a craniotomy on you, I could find a tool in here to cut your head <laughs> up. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you gotta be resourceful, I guess. Yeah. <laughs>